Hey, awesome listeners. It's Michael Martin from Martin Chronicle. Today, my guest is a good friend of mine, Aaron Brown. He's the chief risk manager of AQR Capital Management, a firm that has over $120 billion in assets. If you know me, Aaron's my kind of guy. He plays poker. He's a big math guy. He actually was a um, one of the forefront guys on value at risk. And we talk about that in his new book, which is Risk Management for Dummies. I can assure you, having read the book from front to back, it is not about being a dummy at all. This is a very rich book. Like Aaron's other books, it's full of history lessons and good footnotes for you to pick up some hints on risk management. So enjoy the show. You're listening to The Michael Martin Show. Michael Martin is the author of The Inner Voice of Trading and the founder of MartinChronicle.com, an educational website where you can learn about trading and investing from world-renowned instructors such as Peter Borish and Scott Kaminsky. Now, here's Michael Martin and today's guest. So, Aaron, uh, risk management for dummies. I mean, by the very virtue that they would actually buy this book, um, they're not going to be dummies at all. I mean, because risk management is a very serious issue for both investors and and traders alike. Having read and or having read your book, Red Blooded Risk, how did you come to write a book for the uh, For Dummies franchise? Well, thanks for having me, Michael. Uh, The short answer to your question is they uh, they invited me, and uh, they paid me, and uh, that's usually uh, gets gets at least a good consideration in my book. Um, I'm actually a big fan of the Four Dummies books. Uh, They started in about 1990 with technical computer books, and and the guy who wrote the first one, his theory was. most of the books explaining technical topics delve deep into the details and teach you a lot of uh, stuff, esoteric stuff that only experts need to know. And there are a lot of people who want to know something about the field but don't want to spend 10 years. You take a subject, of, a complicated subject like uh, computer programming or risk management, and you reduce it to step-by-step instructions, kind of cookbook. Here's, you know, you do this, then you do this. Here's why you do it. Uh, but no theoretical, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, flourishes, no math in there just for the sake of math, just here's what you do and here's why you do it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how this book follows too. I, you know, when I, when I do podcasts like this about books, I actually do my own notes and I read through the book. Um, I've read, obviously we did an interview for Red Blooded Risk. Um, I like the idea that they paid you. There's a good exchange of value. Um, it's uh, it's a di- I, would you find that you're writing for a different audience though? Like because when you write something like Red Blooded Risk, for example, um, that seems like it would appeal to more of a historian or somebody who's going through a CQF, a Paul Wilmot kind of a deal. The For Dummies, it seems, unless I'm mistaken, is a different demographic, a different target audience. Did you find writing for a different audience uh, more challenging? Yeah, one of, yeah, Michael, one of the things that I do as an author, and I, I suspect most people do this when writing, is you have somebody in mind you're addressing, and it might be a friend of yours or, or you know, a professor or, or you know, someone else, and, and you're kind of having a conversation with them, and you're trying to you know, answer the questions in the order they would ask them and, and provide the background they would need. Um, Four Dummies is entirely different. Uh, I compare it to, you know, let's say you're a singer-songwriter, you're used to going up on stage and doing whatever you want, and then suddenly you're now the lead singer of some band, and people come to see the band, not you, and there's hundreds of groupies and backup musicians and stuff, and they just tell you what to do, and you do it. Uh, Four Dummies, you don't really have a chance to pick your audience. Uh, you're... you're uh, you write stuff, and then a group of experts in the Ford Dummies brand uh, beat up on it and take it apart and you know, rip out anything that's theoretical, rip out anything that's not specific, actionable um, things to do. 
Um, it's definitely a challenge. It's more a challenge to ego than anything else. Uh, you know, you're used to, you know, you write a, a sure. book like Red Blood and Mr. Wiley. They take you out to dinner. They pay you a lot of money. They tell you how great everything is. They're, they're apologetic about edits. They say, you know, would you please consider maybe, you know, correcting this stupid part? Um, for dummies, it's not at all like that. It's, you know, you're giving it to them and they're like crumpling it up and saying, hey, do go back and do it right. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, once you get past the ego part of that, it's, uh, it, it, it's actually easier in some ways. Uh, writing can be very lonely, you know, halfway through the book, like a red-blooded risk. You think, you know, is anybody going to read this? Is, am I just, you know, babbling to myself? Uh, you don't have that problem with Ford Dummies. You know, once you got that past those editors and they've got it all lined up, uh, you know, it's, it, it's something that, that people want to read. Lots of people have read this book. Uh, before it ever got published, uh, which is, you know, Red Blooded Riss are probably two or three people who read the whole book before it, uh, uh, before it was published. But Four Dummies has an entire team of people and people looking for very specific uh, things. They have a technical people who are looking for any technical errors. Uh, they have, you know, style people who are looking for style and they have content people who are looking for, are you really doing the four dummies uh, uh, brand? So I, I suspect most of the people who buy this book will do it for the yellow cover and the four dummies brand. And, you know, Aaron Brown on the bottom will be not the primary uh, sales pitch. So it's an experience. It's, <laughs> you know, kind of, it, it, it wasn't fun the whole time, but uh, I'm kind of glad I did it. And I think it'll make me a better writer in the future. Well, I will say, and yes, we're friends, I, I will say that um, you have a good voice. And for people who write, you know what that means. Aaron writes in a way, Aaron, you write in a way that, you know, people can follow it. Uh, you also don't blather. Your stuff is footnoted. And you also, and this is actually my favorite part of your books, is, is the sense of history that you have. Everything that you teach, which is really what I think you are at the end of the day, whether you like that or not, I think you're an amazing teacher. Your sense of history is phenomenal. And, and the history lesson, even in For Dummies, is, is uh, very applicable. It puts things in context, and that's so important. I've always said that if you want to be a trader, you want to be a yoga teacher, all that information is on the internet now, and it's free. Information has absolutely become commoditized. If you're going to hire a coach, a mentor, or a teacher, what you really want is the insight and the wisdom. And so when you make a statement or say something provocative in both Red-Blooded Risk and Risk Management for Dummies, your new book, you give it context where needed with these beautiful gray area blurbs in the book, um, which are very, very insightful. And it, it gives a person a moment of pause to go back and read the section again and kind of see things, I think, the way that, that you intended to um, write them which is hard. It's hard to write a book on finance, right? I mean, this is still, you know, risk management. It's not easy stuff. Um, you know, with that. Can I, though, interrupt for just a second? I want to thank you for that. All authors are incredibly vain. And I, I didn't know that until I became an author. Um, I noticed it with other people, but I thought they were just vain people who happened to write. But the minute you put a book out there, you get vain. And any kind of praise uh, is great. And I've sort of given up trying to be humble and modest and whatever. I just, I, I love the praise. Thanks a lot. Especially after writing a Ford Dummies book where a whole team of editors, uh, professionals working together, have beaten up on you about your writing for uh, six or eight months. It uh, feels really really good to have somebody say something good about it. Uh, no Ford Dummies editor would ever say anything good about the material you send. Yeah. Well, and then you have to survive Nassim Taleb, and that's a whole other level. <laughs> that's a well, whole other level understand of understand him. Yeah, well, I mean, he speaks Greek. We're going to get into Greeks in a bit. So, Aaron, uh, you Lebanese, know... Lebanese, actually. That's right. He is the Lebanese man. Um, so, here we have an audience of, of aspiring traders and, and what I call super sophomores, you know? And there's a lot of things that they're thinking about. They're thinking about creating alpha, risk management. They're trying to be mindful of what they're doing. They're trying to run a business. It's very, very interesting. When I'll go back to myself. When I was looking at Lotus 123 spreadsheets where I was putting ASCII, ASCII data into the rows in my Fox Pro database going back just to date myself, the first thing was to try to figure out how to make money. Then you had to say, okay, we have to make money, but now we have to be concerned if we're running public money with both the frequency and the length of the drawdown, because that's a big deal. And then you have risk management, 
So when you look at it now from your perch at AQR, when you look at the process of trying to create an overall model of both making money, keeping losses small, and risk management, where's the best place for risk management to kind of creep into the process, if you know what I'm saying? Like when I'm trying to culture the pearl, where, where does risk management come in? When do I first meet risk management? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing we learned about risk management, and this was not obvious. I went through the same process you did, and this would be in the 1980s. And it took a lot of hard knocks and mistakes and uh, you know, getting beat up by the market um, before I really figured out that it, risk management, you can't integrate it into the process. You can't be thinking of alpha and risk management at the same time. You really need... Uh, to have them independent. And that can mean like at a company like AQR, we just have an independent risk manager, that's me, and I have a staff, and we just completely look, we look at everything from scratch. We don't, you know, take any front office estimates. We don't, you know, look at, we don't ask people why they're doing what they're doing. We look at their positions and we take it just a fresh look at everything. Uh, if you're doing it yourself and you're not, you know, big enough that you want to hire a separate person to be risk manager, you still want to set aside different thinking time. You know, you want to spend a lot of time thinking about alpha and you don't want risk in your mind even when you're doing it. Just, you know, what's, where can I make money? Then, you know, take a break, you know, go for a walk uh, and come back and say, okay, you know, what kind of positions am I going to be having? What kind of stresses are they going to be under? What are my maximum drawdowns going to be? Will I have liquidity issues? Will I have transaction cost issues and so forth? And, and it, when you're doing that, you can't be thinking about, hey, this stress strategy is so great, I don't mind having a few liquidity issues or having a few stressful positions. You know, you got to put that out of your mind. I don't care if it's a great trade or a terrible trade. All I'm thinking about is what are the positions and how, they sh how, how should they be managed. So the first part, you're thinking about how to make money. And the second part, you're thinking about how to survive long enough to make that build that up to a meaningful amount of money. I appreciate that. And I just want to say, because I do a bit of teaching, that you know, folks, be kind to yourselves because this is hard, right? If everybody could run money, they'd be doing it. It's fantastically difficult. Even the guys that Aaron is dealing with who are probably some of the best in the world, they still sometimes have self-doubts. They still have the same things that you're dealing with because they're human beings. And this is a, a constant motion thing of creating alpha, Worrying about drawdowns and liquidities, and that's before you get ripped off by the high-frequency traders, because when you're trading $180 billion or whatever it is that you guys have under management, slippage and skid is an issue. Um, but I want to go back to this, though. To, to, I'm going to do what you do now. This is the gray blurb on the point that I was trying to make. If I take my simulator and I run my system and I, and I say start it on day two as opposed to day one, i.e. if I'm going to Monte Carlo the thing, by the time I do that, I can get some wildly different results that lead me to believe that when I do run my system with real-time money, there's still an enormous amount of luck about when I start my trading. Because if I look back in history, I can, get, I can run the same rules with the same position sizing algorithm run this and run through the same, risk, the, the same risk management in terms of stop losses, when to take winners and you know putting in a modest amount for slippage and skid account for fees and i can have i can make 25% and i can lose 20% depending on when i start the ding so sooner or later though you have to think about risk management in in at the end of the day it must be fantastically difficult to figure out if the person's lucky or or if they're actually have a possibility to create alpha do you find yourself thinking about that a lot in sure. your business? Sure. I, I, I call that the second level of wisdom. The, the first level of wisdom that comes across when you're a trader is that you're only right 51% of the time, if, if you're really, really good. You know, you may think you have 60%, 70%, 80% ideas, but, you know, it's, uh, you're wrong an awful lot. And, and you can't let that hit your confidence. You can't let that, you know, destroy your uh, idea that you have value. Uh, you just have to be prepared for it. Um, and you have to let go of some things where, you know, you just knew you were right, but the market didn't know that. Then the second level of wisdom, once you, once you kind of get comfortable with that, okay, I have good days and bad days, but I have more good days than bad days, and, and I make more of my good days and I lose on my bad days, so in the long run, I'm okay. 
but you might not be. You know, you might be absolutely right. You might have an edge, but you can go through very long periods of time, uh, possibly even entire careers where that just doesn't uh, pan out. And as you say, you know, the back test, you know, we, we run very sophisticated uh, programs here. We may, uh, you know, test it, back test it over 60, 70 years, and it really matters. You start the thing on Monday, and it's the best thing ever happened, and you start the thing on Tuesday, and it's a disaster. Um, and that's just something you have to live with and accept. You have to make sure that the disasters don't kill you. And, and, and this, I think, is the hard part. A lot of people assume that if you had a disaster, it was because you had a bad idea in the first place. That's just not true. You can have a perfectly great idea. You can implement it everything just fine. And just, you know, the luck of the time you started it, you know, you just happened to rebalance at all the wrong times. You happened to, you know, cut things just before they were about to jump and, you know, get into positions just before they're about to fall. Uh, that happens to the best people, maybe not Jim Simons, but everybody else in the world. Right. And, uh, or Ed Thorpe, maybe, maybe he's figured out the secret, but, but, you know, ordinary mortals just don't have the secret to avoiding that. So you got to start out by saying, even if I'm right, forget about, you know, that doesn't matter. I got to make sure that if this thing doesn't work out, it doesn't kill me. And, and this is just as important and actually somewhat harder, you got to look at other things and say, okay, if this thing is right, I really got to milk it. I got to make sure I get every penny of value I can out of it um, because I need that money uh, for other things. I'm not playing with house money. You know, the fact that, you know, I had a hundred percent return in my first month and I'm feeling like I'm the smartest person in the world. Uh, you can't, you know, turn down maybe a 2% return the second month because uh, that 2% you're going to need because that hundred percent can get you know, frittered away on some ideas that don't work. Um, and those two lessons are, are very, very important and, uh, and, and very hard for people to learn. You're right. It is hard stuff. It's your, your brain is almost wired to make you fail at this stuff. And that goes to our educational system where it's an accuracy based model where, you know, in some part of trading, there's a Bayesian aspect or there's a, um, an expected value standpoint where certain models can be right only 40% of the time, but the magnitude of the winner over the loser is so much greater that you can actually make money doing it. Um, it's very difficult for smart people, you know, to come out of, you know, uh, you know, a quantitative finance PhD program at Columbia University and come down and then have to be wrong. I think it does a wonderful, it must, it wreaks havoc on their psyche. Um, sure. And it goes back to kindergarten. You know, you only raise your hand when you're sure you're right. You know, they don't teach you to, you know, raise your hand when you're 51%. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> but Unless, that's, of course, you can get 200 points on the answer and then you have an expected value on the reward. But yeah, I think you're right. That's awesome. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Save yourself the embarrassment. Um, we're going to talk most about most smart people. By the way, this is just my experience. More smart people are much more afraid of feel, of looking stupid than they are of losing money. And if any time in any trade, I don't care any financial business, trading, you know, anything, the minute you stop having a laser, single-minded focus on making money, the minute embarrassment comes into it, or proving that you're smart, or having a good story to tell your girlfriend, or you know, any of that stuff, impressing your classmates, the minute that stuff creeps in, it's just toxic to your whole uh, business. Well, this, but this is a uh, you know, again, I'm a student of yours, and I think. Um... You know, the second chapter of my own humble book was called Surrender, because I think it's really hard for alpha types who are, you know, you know, who are built to go succeed to say, hey, what's important here is that we over we win the battle. Today we might have to surrender, but we're going to come back. We're going to be able to come back tomorrow. But I, I think it is very difficult for smart people to say, hey, I just need to surrender today. I come back tomorrow. I have a clean head. I'll start all over. I can open up a new spreadsheet. And we can start, you know, start afresh. And I can think with a clean head if I get out of my losers. So, yeah, I'll add one further elaboration to that. That's absolutely true. I agree, hundred percent. And it's particularly hard for people to get out when they're right. Uh, and I, the way I put it in poker terms, you know, sometimes you just got to fold your hand. You made some bets. You put money in the pot. You had good reasons for it at the time, but the hands worked out where that no longer makes sense. People have real trouble throwing away their hand if it's a good hand. You know, you got a really strong hand, but it just doesn't make sense to bet at this point. You got to lay it down. So people don't have too much trouble laying down their cards when they miss the draw. So they don't have a good hand, um, but they have real trouble 
uh, giving up when they're right. And if you come up with a trade thesis and the trade thesis is right, but it gets totally blown on the water because there's an earthquake in Japan or because the Fed does a surprise move or because, you know, you're, something else happens. Um, but you just got to get out. You got to say, okay, you know, I'm losing more than I can afford. It doesn't matter that I was right. You know, uh, I just got to get out. And especially if it makes you look stupid, if you told everybody, hey, I'm in this great position, I'm going to make a fortune in it. And you got to go back and say, you know, well, I lost money and got out. But you just got to do it. And speaking from experience, I was playing in a cash game the other night. I was on the button and I had pocket aces. And a guy who had been playing tight all night, I was certain that he had uh, a flush. And he, it looked like he could have had a straight flush. And it was very, very painful. I knew he could be bluffing me out. But to fold pocket aces when I'm on the button... Uh, I had a sense, and lo and behold, he did have the straight flush. You know, again, over thousands of hands. Who knows if that's a bluff or whatever? But it is. It is a very difficult thing to fold a solid hand when you know it's very rare to get pocket aces anyway. So um, I just say to people, this is where the mindfulness part comes in, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, now, without getting into things that could be potential conflicts or endorsements. Most of the folks that I know don't have access to, you know, JP Morgan had the risk risk IQ or something like that on the internet where you could run one variation of value at risk. I know some folks have the, the add-in things to Excel. Where's a good place for someone to start to think about risk management and the things you speak about the book, you know, without having to go log into a $50,000 a year type of deal for these super advanced studies that, you know, a place like Renaissance or AQR might use? Well, I'll tell you, I don't think there's a whole lot of value in the third-party uh, risk products. I think those are more for compliance purposes, for you know, customer, uh, client reporting and things like that. Um, if you're running other people's money in any reasonably large business, uh, you're going to want to have the computer VAR either for uh, regulatory reporting or if you're too small for that, uh, your clients are just going to want to see it just to know that you know, you're checking the right boxes for things. That's not really about risk management. And I think unless you're running extremely highly quantitative, you know, diversified portfolios with thousands of positions and created by computer, um, I don't think you need to analyze them in some incredibly sophisticated way. Um, you want to do some basic stuff. You want to do some stress tests. You want to think about, okay, you know, what are some bad market environments for my positions and, and what am I going to do in those? You know, make some contingency plans. Uh, how much will I lose before I get out um, um, of, of this trade? And you're not thinking about how much can I afford to lose because if you're doing that, you're letting your positions your, your positions manage your risk for you or your risk manage your trading. You want to do it the other way around. You want uh, you want to manage your risk. And that means you say, okay, at what point would I think my thesis was wrong? At what point would I want to get out because I was wrong? And then you size your trade so that you can afford that loss. Um, and uh, these are the kinds of things. You don't take any fancy mathematics. Um, you certainly want to understand the instruments you're trading. I think where you get into trouble is let's say you're trading something and you just kind of found this pattern, you know, you ran some numbers and you found a pattern, but you don't know anything. It's just a ticker symbol to you, or it's just a, you know, futures code to you. You got no idea about the uh, economics behind it. Then I think you have real trouble risk managing it. Um, um, and I think that's, that's sort of a quant disease sometimes where you, you know, everything about the numbers, uh, the, you know, return history of this thing and what its correlations are with everything else in the world, but you wouldn't recognize it if you stepped in it. Um, that's, uh, that's very dangerous because a lot of the risk is saying, okay, you know, you can't, you, correlations can change in an instant, you know, history can be unprecedented. Uh, you got to know what's kind of the fundamental economics of what's going on. Not that you have to be an expert. You don't have to be a, you know, chemical engineer to, to trade a, a chemical company or to trade a crude oil or something like that. But you got to really know the basics of uh, what's going on, what the bets you're making in real economic terms are. So, and I, I go through this at least once a day where I say, we can measure everything until we're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, I feel like I make money because I can stick to my discipline and there's a fair amount of luck. I've been lucky, I've had bad luck, and that's just the way it goes. Um, now, in the book, you discuss that there's kind of there's three ways to measure value at risk, and 
I think if I read closely, you advocate actually doing all three and just seeing if there's like an outlier or if one is telling you something that the other one isn't. Um, you want to elaborate on that for a second? Yeah, um, one, one of the things, and this, this is something I had to really struggle to get past the four dummies uh, editors, that um, <laughs> I said, it's really important that value at risk, we use the same word for a risk measure and a risk metric. Um, a risk measure is a way you're going to define your risk. And with value at risk, we define it as P&L over a one-day period if you did no trading. So it's just defined as... Uh, um, the one-day move in your current positions you are holding at the moment. Um, and and once you decide you're going to measure risk that way, there's a lot of different metrics you could use. You could say, okay, what's the volatility of that? What's the uh, you know worst-case outcome? What's the interquartile range, whatever? But in fact, we choose the metric to measure, okay, what's the 5% point? What is the point where 95% of the time I'll do better and, and 5% I'll, I'll do worse? Um, in terms of the risk measure, you really need a lot of risk measures. You can't focus on any one. Uh, the one-day P&L move of your current position, that's certainly an important uh, thing about your risk. Uh, but there's a lot of other dimensions of risk, uh, you know, different time periods, what happens when you actually do trade, uh, what happens if there's liquidity problems, uh, what happens if there's some kind of regulatory change or something that, you know, changes the nature of your positions. Um, so all of these things are important. You want to have a lot of different risk measures, not just three. You know, there, there's a lot of different ones you could use. Um, but picking one risk metric, putting everything as much as you can into a single risk metric is very useful because then you can compare the different things. Otherwise, you're left with this idea, well, I got 50 different risks and I got no idea which are the big ones and which are the small ones. Or, you know, if I control this one, will I control other ones? Um, and one of the advantages of the risk metric is you can put almost everything uh, into uh, uh, value risk terms in terms of saying, okay, you know, what's my 5% worst outcome? Don't ask what's the worst possible thing that can happen because, you know, things could always be worse. That's just meaningless. Nobody really knows. Um, but you can say, okay, you know, 19 days out of 20, what happens and what happens on the 20th one? Um, and at least you can get some rough answer to that for almost all these different kinds of risk measures. Um, and then immediately, you know, okay, here's the ones I have to focus on. Here are the things that are going to inflict my crippling losses. And here are the other ones. Yeah, they're risky. Yeah, they cost me money sometimes, but they're not going to be the difference between surviving and not surviving. They're not going to be a question of, you know, can I keep in the trade or not? Um, they're just going to be ordinary losses. And to the extent that's true, you say, okay, I think I have an edge. Uh, I can afford the losses. So I'll just take this risk and I'll let it play out over time. I'll let it diversify away and I'll just, you know, collect the edge in the long run, like a casino with a roulette wheel. They don't care about winning or losing on any spin. They don't care whether you're at red or black. They just know they have an edge and everything else averages out over time. But the things that are survival uh, questions for you, the things that could force you to, uh, you know, either blow up completely and get out of the business or, you know, just have kind of negative events you want to avoid. Uh, that might mean losing clients. That might mean having to take off your positions to rebuild your bankroll for a while. It could mean having to get out of positions at very disadvantageous fire sale prices. Uh, those are the ones you want to focus on for risk purposes. Those are the risks you don't want to take. And so, you know, with that, um, you said something very, very provocative in the book, and I'm going to quote you. It says, if you don't understand center risk, what happens on 95% of the days, your opinions about tail risk in frequent large losses are probably worthless. Explain, uh, while you have the mic in your hand here, what center risk is, and then we can go into the tails. Sure. Um, and this is this was that statement was sort of an answer to people who criticize value at risk. They say that, well, it isn't the worst case loss and it isn't, it assumes normal days. So it doesn't tell you what happens on, you know, the really extreme market days or when markets break down. Um, it's uh, current positions. It doesn't take into account trading. So it doesn't take into account the risk that you trade and make things worse. Um, and it's only, you know, 5% of the time you do worse. Uh, the reason that it's important though, is what value at risk tells you in order, in order to, 
you know, estimate a good value at risk and, and really have it accurate, and, and you can test statistically whether your estimates are accurate or not, you have to understand what happens on the 19 days out of 20. You have to, and, and that's what I call the center risk, the stuff that happens all the time, where you have a lot of data on it, it's routine, uh, there's no questions about, well, what would the market do, or will my broker be bankrupt, or, uh, you know, will, uh, will, will something be you know, un- remarkable happen. It's just, these are the normal 90, uh, 19 days out of 20. And people who can't really figure that out, and when I say figure it out, I mean really make precise estimates of exactly what is their 5% loss point. Um, they don't understand what's going on in the normal days. They don't understand what's driving their daily ups and downs. And it's just my opinion. <laughs> you know, if you don't understand that, that's a simple thing. You know, you don't understand what happens 19 days out of 20 with plenty of data where everything is normal. I, I have no faith at all that when you uh, speculate about tail risk, you know, what might happen on the one day in a million or what might happen if, you know, there's a market crash or there's a, you know, dramatic event. Uh, I don't put any faith in that at all. So let me say if I'm coming to you and I have an idea to trade, say, stock index futures or certainly instruments that would be correlated to the market like the S&P at large, and I came to you with a, a, a trying to understand center risk and with a 20-day look back, to me, just though, as a poker player, wouldn't it make sense for me to say like, wow, the high-frequency traders could hit a button at any given day. They can read headlines. They can make a mountain out of a molehill. And I know I don't have the data in front of me right now to back it up, but it seems to me like a three to a five standard deviation day down because of the prevalence of high frequency trading in computers it seems a lot more probable than it was 20 years ago when everything was trading in eighths and there were guys on the floor and all that. So would you, what would you have me do to go back and look at – would it look like a 90-day look back? Would, it, would you want me to go back and look and see the the May – you know, thousand thousand uh, point flash crash. What well, would you have me do? Yeah, well, the first thing I would do is, I mean, you're asking the hard question. I, I would start with the easier question. I would say, okay, let's just assume that that's not true. Let's assume the stock market hasn't changed in the last fifty or sixty years or whatever. Let's just grab some data, and let me ask if I estimate, say, a ninety day standard deviation, uh, you know, three month standard deviation. How often do I get a three standard deviation, four standard deviation, five standard deviation down move? Um, and you'll find you get a lot more than you know a normal theory um, would suggest. So you can't just look at volatility and say, okay, well I know I can't lose more than three standard deviations, you know, very often. You, you can't. So then you say, okay, uh, what's the reason for it? Is it that the market has fat tails that any day at random can be a big down day, or are there warning signs? Is it that you know most days? You're not likely to get a really big down day, but there are days that you can identify in advance uh, where big down days are possible. And obviously, for risk management purposes, that's a crucial uh, piece of information. Once you've kind of analyzed that and you've satisfied yourself, okay, now I understand how the stock market has worked, assuming that it always works the same way, you know, in the last uh, for the last 60 years. Now you got to say, okay, let me talk, think about tomorrow. And tomorrow, I don't care about the average of the last 60 years. I care about what things are right now. Uh, and you're right, flash crashes are a big uh, part of that analysis. We know, you know um, the 2010, May 2010 one is, of course, the uh, really big one, the first time we invented the term flash crash, I believe. Um, but we've had other similar kinds of events, uh, most recently last August 24th. Um, uh, right. 2015. And it, it wasn't exactly the same. It wasn't as bad. But we saw that the market behaved in strange ways that have no economic interpretation and, and that were uh, unprecedented except for the last five years. Um, so we got to think, okay, what's causing those now? Maybe we can figure it out. Um, or maybe we can't figure it out, but we got to somehow build into our models these can happen. And we got to say, are there warning signs to this? Are there markets that are particularly vulnerable to this? Uh, One thing I will tell you that that from my observation, when we get days like that, and I would say there have been, uh, say, six or seven uh, since the first one, there are always times when there is fear in the market of some kind of – um, you know, discrete event that some people might know about. In the original flash crash, there was really bad news out of Europe. It was really possible that, you know, Greece would have decided to default or, you know, the European Central Bank would have taken some really uh, um, dramatic action that was bad for markets and that some people knew about it and uh, and you didn't. Uh, 
And in that kind of a market, you're not going to try to grab a falling knife. You're not going you know, to say, hey, look, stocks are 20% cheaper than they were five minutes ago. I'm going to buy. Uh, you're going to say, I bet somebody knows something and I don't know, so I'm going to stay out. Um, now, why does that now cause sort of flash crashy kind of market behavior when, I mean, we've always had that situation. Uh, and it's never caused this kind of behavior before. Um, you know, you got to think about that. But in terms of risk management purposes, even if you can't figure out why it's true, you got to know these discrete events of this uh, type are just much more salient for risk management than they were before 2010. You know, we never used to, we used to think about what are dramatic events that could happen, um, but we never really thought about what's the difference between an event that might happen gradually that you're going to know about before it's really certain for this, these discrete, you know, one zero events, they either happen or they don't. And some people are going to find out and finding out even five minutes later could cost you a lot of money. Um, these types of events you have to now put a lot of extra emphasis on analyzing for your risk purposes. Appreciate that answer. I think that says a lot. Now, suppose then that I have a good sense of a center risk and I have it with my desk manager and I have it with you. What's the next step when we start talking about tail risk? Am I looking to hedge it away or do I want to make believe that it doesn't exist because we can't you know, simulate or, or we can signify that it's so improbable, it's not something that we should worry about while we're doing the day to day and how we you know, put the trades on? Well, hedging away is general. It's often impossible because the whole point of tail risks is there are situations where you don't have a lot of data, uh, where markets aren't behaving normally. And so, you know, the relationship you would count on for your hedge might not happen. A lot of people have been burned by things they thought were hedges that turned out to lose money at the same time their positions were. You know, there might have been hedges on normal days, but they weren't hedges when you needed them. And, and if you can find hedges, and there are some, I mean, you know, S&P 500 puts are a pretty good hedge against most bad market. You know, it's hard. Something really bad happens to the market. You can bet, you know, equity volatility is up and stocks are down and you're going to make money on your puts. But they're very expensive. You lose a ton of money buying them and holding them. They just, uh, you know, in normal times, you just lose so much money that even if they do pay off big in the crisis, you probably paid more for them, you know, before it happens and you... Uh, went back. So hedging is, is not a big option. And by the way, risk managers always, you know, hedging is always a bad thing. I mean, you do it, when I say it's a bad thing, I don't mean you never do it. Sometimes it's the least bad of your options. But there's always, at least in principle, something better to do. If there's a risk you don't want, you get rid of it. Uh, keeping it and then trying to get something that'll offset it is a, a, you know, a, not even a second best, a third, fourth, fifth and best uh, solution. Uh, ignoring it also doesn't make sense. Ignoring it is the standard reaction, um, or, or, or I guess the other standard reaction is to overreact to it. So, you know, uh, uh, put much too tight limits on things because you're afraid of this event you can't really quantify. Uh, no, you got to face up to it. You got to make a contingency plan. And that involves a lot of hand waving and guessing. You know, you're going to say, okay, how big a crash do I want to prepare for? And you got to tell yourself, okay, I am betting my business or I'm betting my net worth or whatever I am betting. I'm betting that on there never being an event bigger than this. And you sit back, am I comfortable with that bet? It's a trading decision like anything else. Um, and, and there's no magic way to do it. It's not like risk managers have this incredible insight. We go and, you know, smoke the midnight oil or something and it comes to us in a stone tablet of what the right result is. Uh, and there is no right answer. You know, you can do bigger or small and, and take more or less risk, but you got to think through, and you got to think through in advance and make your best choice, and that gives you your discipline. And you said something earlier, you know, if you have discipline in your process, you know, then, then you have a chance to make it. If you don't have discipline, it's almost guaranteed you make the wrong choices. Um, so that's all risk management does really is prevent you from making the stupidest possible choice. You may well make the second stupidest, but you know, that's, uh, you know, eliminating the stupidest possible choice is actually a significant advantage. It, it brings forth though, that, you know, when you have studied, you know, differential equations and stochastic calculus and CQFs, and you still have to come down to using your judgment. And that's hard for a lot of systematized traders because they're taught that if you have a system, you don't need fundamentals, you keep your ego or your emotions out of it because all you have to do is follow the rules. But when you're sitting with a risk manager, there's so much more to it than just saying, hey man, I follow my system. And you know, we do have to estimate these types of things. 
I mean, without mentioning any names, um, because I, well, I'll mention his name, Victor Niederhofer. Guy has more brains in his left pinky than I'll probably ever have, but yet, um, you know, he underestimated gamma risk, right, by being short a bunch of S&P futures or puts on futures, I think three times over his career. And this is an exceptionally bright guy. And I just, you know, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but there has to be a disconnect between, you know, looking at the value at risk or whatever risk management tools they're looking at and then, you know, putting the trades on and then, like I said before, hoping that bad things don't happen. Is it just fantastically bad luck that it's happened to him, you know, two or three times in his career? Or how, how, do, how, does, how can someone who's an emerging trader learn from that? Yeah, I think one thing is people do tend to overemphasize disasters. You know, they think, well, if there's a disaster, it must have been bad risk management. And that just, you know, that's actually what you're doing is you're putting too much confidence in risk management. Um, you can certainly have great risk management and, 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 and have a disaster. It's, it's just the way things work. Risk management doesn't actually help that much. It's in a, it helps an essential amount that it's if, in the sense that if you don't have it, it's that little edge that makes you a casino instead of a, a, you know, some guy playing roulette at the casino. So it's an important edge, but it's not a big one. You know, on each spin of the roulette wheel, it doesn't make much difference. Um, in the case of Victor Niederhofer, the reason I think he's a poor risk manager is reading his book. Um, the Education of a Speculator. And I read that book before he had ever blown up. And uh, Nassim Taleb did the same thing and actually went to see him after the book. And he came back and we discussed it. And then he said, uh, Tom said to me, you know, that guy's going to blow up. And I said, I agree. I said, you know, the first chapter of his book tells me this is a guy who's going to blow up. I don't say his mistake was underestimating gamma risk. Um, you know, it's a trading decision, and he's very good at trading decisions. And I suspect that you know his trading decisions were were pretty sound. Um, but I don't believe that he really thought through all the scenarios. I, I I believe that when he did his trading, he thought through the 95% scenarios that the other 5% are you know I, I have no information about, which is pretty close to true. You have very little information about them, and there's no point in thinking them through now and making some guesses as to things because they'd just be guesses. You know, I'm a great trader. 95% of the time, I know exactly what I'm doing. The other 5%, I'm just going to trust to luck. And that's a disastrous risk management uh, problem. And, and the, when you open it up with the quant, who knows all about stochastic processes and differential equations and so forth, um, what they hate about it is when you're talking about these tail risks, this 5%, you don't have anywhere near the precision, the data uh, you have for, uh, uh, for for the trading decisions. And, you know, you know you're really good at the precise data-driven 95% of the time, and, you know, you're really bad at figuring out the rest of it, so you naturally do what you're good at and avoid what you're bad at. But good or bad at it, and nobody Nobody's good at it. Nobody really knows what's going to happen in the tail. That's kind of the myth that, that a great risk manager is somebody who has great insight into what happens in the tail. Uh, you don't, but you at least make some assumptions. You say, okay, you know, let's, let me make sure that I'm not doing perverse behavior that guarantees I'll blow up. You know, I may blow up anyway, but it will be because I thought things through and either something happened that I thought couldn't, you know, that I decided to bet would not happen or I'd miss. I misunderstood what was going to happen. You know, some, something happened that I thought was plausible, but it affected my portfolio in a different way. What you never want to have happen is you, got, you blew up because something you never thought about happened. That's, that's the fate you can avoid. And while we're talking about options, we have to talk about the Greeks. And at this moment in time, I remember my Virgil from undergrad, Timeo Deneos e Donna Ferentis. I fear the Greeks, even those bearing gifts. <laughs> and so... Do the Greeks, as it relates to the options, give us a false sense of security? Or yeah. do they really represent, keeping Virgil in the, in the process here, do they really represent a bit of a risk management Trojan horse in our overall risk management scheme? Yeah, let, let's, let's sort of take it one level up. And by the way, the Greek chapter, I have a chapter on the Greeks in the book. That was another one that was very hard to get past the Four Dummies editor because they said, you know, the whole point, nobody wants to see Greek letters in a Four Dummies book. And I said, but, you know, it's not, not the fact that they're represented by Greek letters. There's an important concept. What a Greek is, and it's not just the gamma delta of, uh, of uh, options trading. It really applies to all financial businesses, is you try and take a generalized risk and reduce it to one number. So, you know, you have, well, 
all kinds of different, there's all sorts of interest rates in the world, millions of different interest rates. You might have a lot of different positions that are affected by different ways and different interest rates, but you still want to know kind of what is my duration. In other words, if interest rates go up one basis point, what's the probable effect on my portfolio? Um, and that is a very useful thing to know in normal times. Um, also, you know, what's my beta to the stock market? Uh, what's my alpha? You know, that's a really important thing to know. So all of these are really useful things. And you can summarize a huge position, you know, thousands of positions, all sorts of complicated ins and outs, structured products, derivatives, whatever. But you can give it a single number. Um, and that's, uh, that, that's the whole theory of what a Greek is. Um, and it's, we do it a lot in finance. So it's very valuable for, uh, for that. But the trouble is Greeks unravel in the tail. When you get these tail events, you know, the 5% of days where things don't go normally, uh, you find that interest rates are diverging. You know, some are going up and some are going down. And, and even ones that should be exactly the same are behaving differently. And uh, even though an interest rate is going up and you've got some structured product that should be going up because of that, it's actually going down in price um, just uh, just because of the way the market's pricing it. It might not make any sense. It might you know be irrational economically, but it is, in fact, happening. So they are Trojan horses in the sense that uh, they're very good for managing risk in normal times and they're very useful things and we couldn't run finance without them, but you just cannot count on them in uh, extreme times. So if somebody says, well, gee, if the stock market crashes uh, 40%, uh, I don't really care because my beta is only 0.05. So I'll only lose 5% of what the stock market loses. And if the stock market goes down 40%, I can afford a 2% loss uh, on my portfolio. But the problem is when the stock market crashes 40%, your beta will not be 0.05. It might be 0.5. Right. It might be negative 0.5, you know, whatever. But the one thing you know is it's not going to be 0.05. So that's great. That tells you, you know, if the market goes down 1%, sure, you'll lose five basis points. That, uh, you know, that's probably a pretty accurate prediction. But uh, you can't use that for your tail risk. Now, there are traders that, you know, do pretty well in looking at extreme events. And maybe we'll have to save that for another conversation. I know we've been talking here for about almost 45 minutes. It just seems like if you put in your protective stop orders, you could have your stops run. If you have a big diversified portfolio, you understand that diversification is risk reduction, not risk management. You need it. Yes, it's the free lunch. Um, but still, I'm kind of coming back to thinking that despite all the studies and everything, it's really just a function of bad or good timing of whether or not a person gets blasted and has gigantic moves against them in terms of their equity, despite doing a lot of these studies. I mean, maybe I have confidence in my process because I'm looking at these and I'm being as thorough as I possibly can, given the amount of information that we have from people like yourself all the way down to like studying the turtle trading rules um, and all that. Um, but where, where, at the end of the day, we have to put the trades on. We also know that when markets go bad, everything becomes correlated. So in anticipation of that, do you, do you, do you make sure that one's position sizes are reasonable, that they can be offset? with decent liquidity or what kind of proactive steps do you take with a trader or with a, a group of traders, say the energy traders? Yeah, well, you, uh, I mean, there's a number of tools you use for that. The most basic one and, and, and perhaps the most important and one of the simplest is just a scenario analysis. So you, you know, you come up with a scenario, uh, it could be based on history. A lot of people like to base them on history. You can make one up hypothetically and you say, okay, let's, walk through this, you know, step by step. So day one or, you know, second one depends what kind of trading you do, whether you're doing this in seconds or in days or weeks, perhaps, um, you know, some events happen and how do you adjust? And then you say, okay, now let's go forward. And the next time interval, okay, these events have happened since what do you do? And, 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 and you actually ask people these questions and you discuss it and you do this in a group, uh, you know, it's usually a group of seven, eight people is about right for these. Um, this is assuming you're in a big organization where you got seven or eight people. If you're by yourself, you got to figure out, maybe have a friend do it with you and, 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 and try and go through it. And then once you figured out what you would do in these scenarios, you say, okay, well that, you know, given these sets of decisions, here's the ones we can survive and here's the ones we can't. 
um, or, or here are the ones where we're going to be forced into things, to fire sales, to uh, um, defaulting on things, to uh, not being able to meet redemptions, whatever the, the, you know, these kind of things that really can destroy a business or, or cripple it or, you know, cause, cause much more damage than the loss itself. Typically, you're not looking at the loss itself. You're not saying how much money did we lose, but how much did we hurt ourselves on top of uh, the money lost? Um, and then you make a decision, okay, here are the ones we're going to guard against. And that might mean reducing positions. It might mean hedging some things. It might mean, you know, closing down some strategies. Uh, and here are the ones that we're going to be willing, you know, if, if, if these happen, we're going to go and we know it, um, or, or, or at least we might go. And then we know we're taking that risk, but we're willing to, you know, if, if we guarded against this risk, we couldn't be profitable the rest of the time. So we're, we're not going to do it. Um, and, and once you've done that, then I think you've got some basis for, uh, you know, uh, sizing things and so forth. It's not an exact science by any means, but you've gone through things. It's also very valuable, again, and this is a big organization, doesn't apply to a single trader, but for a big organization, because you've got everybody on board. Uh, one of the things that's a sign of really bad risk management is when you know, bad things are happening in the market, people are having discussions about the philosophy of risk management. You, know, you have those in the good times, you have those in the quiet times. Right, right, in, right. The, in the bad times, regardless of what people think, individually, you have to have a firm, wide position on here's our philosophy of risk management, here's how we look at losses, Here's where we cut losses and so forth. And it can't be a, uh, you know, that's not the time to discuss it. You know, once, once the ball is hiked in football, is not the time for people on the offensive team to be arguing about what play they're going to run. You know, you just had a play. Maybe you think it's a stupid play, but that's the play, and that's the one you're going to follow. That's fair. And I appreciate that too because, yes, you, it's very difficult to make a team decision under when, when there's duress. I'm always thinking, again, because the folks that I'm working with, they're one or two person shops. They might have many as 10 people, but ultimately you typically have one person who's trying to create the alpha and then you have another person who's like Mr. Outside who has to deal with the clients. And it's a real drag to try to have to do both because if they're listening to our conversation, they're, they're probably lost before they even start. So somewhere in there, you have to be a communicator and you know, go to somebody and say, listen, we need to pull back on your allocation this month, not because you're doing badly, but because of the risks that we perceive in the marketplace. What are those conversations like? Yeah, I think that's, that's a very important uh, thing. How you communicate is as important as how you trade. And I think that's something that's uh, – now, if you're trading your own money, it doesn't matter perhaps. But if you've got any kind of a business there – if you prepare clients the right way, if you say, okay, I've got this position, here's an extreme example. You run an S&P 500 index fund and you tell people if the S&P goes down 10%, you are going to lose 10%. Then if the S&P goes down 10% and you lose 10%, fine. Uh, if it goes down, if you go down 12%, then you know maybe maybe they're, they're mad. Or if the S&P goes up 10% and you go up 8%, they're going to be mad. But by communicating things. So if you tell clients, look, we just, we're going to take a risk. We know that every so often there's a, uh, you know, let's say the Fed raises interest rates and we just know we're going to take a hit. When the Fed raises interest rates, we're going to take a hit of 5% of the portfolio on average. Um, but we make up for it because every time they don't raise interest rates, we make a basis point and there's a lot more days when they don't raise interest rates than when they do. And, and so this is our, our strategy. Um, and, you know, if you can make those sorts of things clear to people and you do what you say you're going to do, uh, clients will accept quite a lot of losses um, and, and they won't misinterpret things. You know, the fact that you had a thousand days in a row without any Fed increases and you look like you're making tons of money, you're saying, look, some of that is a reserve for the losses we're going to get when, you know, when, when this does happen. Um, if you miscommunicate, if you seem like you're panicked, if you seem like you're, uh, you know, uh, ignoring losses and, you know, just, just bullheadedly continuing with things, you know, any of those kind of miscommunications are fatal, even, even if you make money. So having consistency with what your clients think you're doing and what you're doing uh, is an enormous advantage. You know, in the long run, if you don't have that match, you're going to end up disappointing people and, and losing money, you know, having them pull the money, even if you're doing pretty well. And if you have that, you can survive an awful lot of stuff. You know, there used to be hedge funds. There's still a few around, but there aren't many, and certainly not many that take, uh, you know, money, outside money, that were just complete black boxes. You know, you give us our money, you give us your money, we're going to make it for you, and I'm going to tell you how um, the Bernie Madoff kind of pitch 
Uh, that just doesn't work anymore, unless, again, you've got a track record like Jim Simon and Thorpe, people might be able to get away with that, but uh, um, those are few and far between. Um, for almost everybody else, you're selling a process, and, so, and, and you know, the process, obviously, if it has good results, you're going to do better than if it has bad results, but following your process is going to protect you from an awful lot of uh, business dangers. Uh, a, a, a question that's related but might be seem like a non sequitur as we wrap things up here. What do you think about you know entering stops in the marketplace versus mental stops? Uh, generally speaking, and this this is going to come back somewhat to your execution capability. I tend to work at places where we have professional trading teams twenty four hours a day, you know, monitoring stuff, and so um, you know. I put the stop with them because um, they can use some judgment. They can say, was my stop truly, ex you know, was my stop uh, air, uh, levels truly broken or not? You know, was it just some weird off trade or maybe an error or something? Um, or, you know, are we going down in such a way where I know we're going to go through the stop and I can execute better now than I will be able to if I wait until it's actually broken. So that kind of trading judgment uh, is, is very valuable. It's always kind of risky to put in a stop uh, with your broker or with a you know computer algorithm or something because you're not really going to be able to choose how how things are interpreted, and you may get especially a flash crash kind of situation. You might get uh, you know stopped out at a uh, at an unfortunate price. I have an example of that in in, in the book. Um, so. If you have the capability to monitor things 24 hours a day and have real market insight, uh, you know, and, and you know, real professional trader watching things, then I would always prefer that to putting in any kind of order. If uh, you don't have that, you know, if you sleep at night and you don't have anybody watching the terminal and you want to have a uh, stop in, the, the, you know, in case something happens overnight or, or you know when you're out of the office or something like that, then you got no choice but to use a uh, a formal order, uh, but something I do discuss in the book that I recommend is you, you, using stop limit orders. Uh, so you know, if the price of the stock drops below twenty dollars, you want to sell at any price above eighteen dollars. But you don't want to, you know, if the stock goes from twenty to ten dollars immediately, you don't want to necessarily take that ten dollars. You're willing to, you know, take the risk of holding on to it so that you don't get burned in a flash crash kind of situation and then say so have a chance to look at it and think about it. So I never go completely automatic. I never go to a limit order where you, I'm sorry, a stop order where you switch to a market order when the stop is hit. Um, I, I just think I, I don't like market orders <laughs> and I don't even like conditional market orders. So if you're going to do it, it, it's a second best solution. It's, you know, you're always better off having a guy as somebody who works for you watching the market. Uh, but if you're going to have your broker watching the market for you or your broker's computer or your own computer for that matter, um, um, that's, you know, that's because you can't afford a trader to do it. So that's all the time we have uh, for this interview with Aaron Brown. I think it's great stuff. It gives you a lot of food for thought as you want to measure risk uh, in your own portfolio across many positions, across your whole system. And when you have a person like Aaron, whose firm is running an enormous amount of money, telling you that it's very, very hard. I want you to take a moment and give yourself a little room to breathe as you try to figure this all out because it's likely that you don't have the resources that many other people do. And I still want to come back to the fact that even if you do the risk management, the best that you're going to do is understand how, like Aaron said, you have the 19 out of 20 days covered. What happens in the fat tails, you don't. And to put it into perspective, I want to quote the, the Bible, Ecclesiastes 9-11, famous quote. Again, I saw under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. If you don't blow up because of an act of God or an outlier move or a black swan, count your blessings and every other day try to come back so that you can play tomorrow. Have a great week. That's all the time we have today. Many thanks for listening. Don't forget to watch the companion educational video over at martinchronicle.com. 
The Michael Martin Show is a podcast that is produced every week for your enjoyment and education. Show notes and links can be found at martinchronicle.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. You can also follow me on Twitter at Martin underscore Chronicle. That's Martin underscore and Chronicle with a K.